Well, if you've been with us at all over the last four weeks, you'll know that we have been leaning into this season of Advent and the rhythm of lighting the candle every Sunday as we kind of work our way through the four themes of Advent that this far, thus far have been peace, hope, joy, and today, love. So I'm going to ask Caitlin if she'll come up and she'll light our candles from our previous weeks just as we consider this week's theme, If you uh, want to know anything about what we've been doing, then uh, there's some of these little booklets out on the info table that you might want to take home. And I know that we're nearly out of time to do it this year, but you might want to just cram it all in in the next four or five days. uh, Or just have it and put it away and bring it out with the family next year. But the other things you might want to get is some of the little reflections that we've created each week. And possibly you've just been too busy to be able to step into that over the last little while. But you were about to go into a bit of a slower season. And so I'd really invite you to actually take some time to consider these themes, what that means for us at Christmas, and this week, love. Now, I don't know what you think about when you think about love. Here we go, all four. Thank you. As we think about love, often we think about all those lovely, you know, warm, scrummy feelings of being loved, of feeling love towards somebody else. We might think about flowers or chocolate or, you know, Valentine's Day or weddings or things like that. But we're actually told, not just in Scripture, but actually by, uh, you know, psychologists, relationship um, counselors, all of that, that love isn't a feeling. It's a verb. It's something that we do. It's something that we choose And we had this ultimate expression of God's love for us in that he chose to send us his son, Jesus, the light of the world, the lover of our souls. And so today, as you come and as we prepare our hearts, that's what Advent, the Advent season is all about, is for us to prepare our hearts for the day that we remember Jesus is coming, not just his coming in the first Christmas, but also his coming again and his presence here with us day by day by day. And John 3.16, which is a very well-known verse, and I'm just going to read it out of a slightly different translation for us to maybe hear it slightly differently. It says this, For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. So now that everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. Life to the full that we begin to experience here, now, and that will go on forever. That God didn't just love the whole world in general, he loved you in particular. It's personal. His love is personal. It's not just some global concept that we agree with. And so as we have our candles going, and hopefully not setting off any alarms, um, We notice, one one of the things we notice about this is that the light is growing. Every week we add another candle. The light is growing and growing and growing. And that is what Jesus' presence in the world is like. His light comes to dispel the darkness, to break the power of things that are just not of him. And his love is that transforming power that does that. So why don't we, I encourage you, even if you don't have all of this set up at home, why not tonight just light a candle and just take a moment to pour your love out towards God, but also to take that verse and put your name in it. This is how much God loved Sarah. This is how much God loved Rex, me. And spend a little bit of time with that or with your children tonight. Okay? All right. It is my pleasure to hand it over to Stanley, who has got our last part of our Advent series. Here you go. (laughs) Thanks, Jacinda. That's cool. Man, what a cool crew of people, eh? What a cool church. You guys are are awesome. Hey, um, if we haven't met and you didn't realize that you're awesome, um, um, I'm Stanley, just one of the pastors around here, and it's, uh, it really is, it's, it's awesome to have you in church, and even if, you're, if you are listening or watching online, uh, this is for you as well, we want you to engage with, uh, with what's taking place today. Today, as Jacinda mentioned, we, we want to um, carry on with what we've been talking, we've been trying to take a fresh look at Christmas, 
You know, not just kind of stopping at the, the nice scene of the nativity scene and so forth that we see around the traps at the moment at this time of year. We want to we wanna step beyond that, and we kind of want to get into the, the thinkings, the feelings, the perspectives of some of the different characters within the Christmas story. Um, you know, not only in terms of the way that we interpret Scripture is that important, but it's just important for life, isn't it? You know, to get on with people well, <laughs> uh, to be a good work colleague, to be a good family member, to be a good spouse. You know, you need to have those moments, right, where you just step into somebody else's shoes, where you just look at life from their, from their way of thinking. What, what is it that... I know what I'm thinking, but what are you thinking? You know, it's, it's good for us just to stop and take a step back and to say, in the middle of an argument, oh, anyone have those? Is that just Rach and I? No. Just to take a step back and to say, discussions, honey, discussions, not arguments. <laughs> to take a step back and to say, okay, right, what is it that you see here? And so when we come into uh, looking at this Christmas story, what we've tried to do over these last few weeks, um, starting with Jacinda, who, uh, who launched us into looking at the story from Mary's perspective, uh, and then last week, Matt, uh, looking at Joseph's take on quite a confronting situation that he found himself in, uh, and this morning, uh, it's, the, it's the chance, it's the, uh, it's the turn of the shepherds. We want to just, we want to have a little look at these shepherds within the Christmas story, these shepherds who are presented very unexpectedly with this incredible, like mind-blowing, amazing piece of news. Uh, And we want to dig into how they think and feel and how they kind of react to that news. But before we do that, shall we pray? God, we thank you for the people around us. We thank you for those that we sit next to that we know, uh, those that we sit next to that we don't. And Father, we pray your blessing on them. God, just as we, as we gather around to focus in on, on your word and this incredible story that, we, that we, we are in the rhythm of celebrating every year that is so precious, we pray that you would bring it alive to our hearts afresh this year. God, as we come and we look again at this story, Father, bring our hearts closer to you. Draw us to your presence, to your goodness, to what you would be trying to tell us in this season of time with this particular good news that we have to celebrate, God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It always feels... um, it always feels nice, doesn't it? Quite exciting to be, to be kind of led in on, on a piece of news, a piece of good news. Uh, you know, I'm sure that many of you have been in the situation where, you know, someone's come to you and they've, they've, they've told you something big, you know, like uh, they're getting married or they're having a child or they've got a new job. And it's, and it's, before, it's, it, it's before it's Facebook official, you know, before kind of the world is announced, um, they come to you, and you know, just that feeling of, oh, shucks, you, know, you, uh, you thought to tell me that. that was, that's cool. Kind of the rest of the world doesn't know. And, but, uh, I remember, um, uh, for me, I was planning to propose to Rach, and I'd been kind of emailing back and forth with some, some friends to kind of help set it up and so forth, uh, but I hadn't, had a, I hadn't been able to have a conversation with someone about it. And I was just like, oh, I just need to talk to someone about this. And uh, so I was sitting in my flat late at night. I remember it uh, pretty clearly. And uh, James happened to be my flatmate at the time. And I was like, James, I just, I've just got to tell you, I've got to tell you that I'm, pro- I'm planning to propose to Rach. And he was like, oh, wow. And I, like I... I knew James, but he was a flatmate. I didn't like, I didn't know him that well, you know. And uh, and he, but he was clearly just so stoked to um, to be told that news, you know, kind of uh, before everybody else. And, and 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 equally so, you know. I remember times of being on the recipient, being the recipient of, of news like that, and what it and what it felt like. I'm 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 sure that probably for everybody in the room, uh, you can think of times where where that's been you, you know, where you've been involved in, in either telling someone or, or receiving that sort of news. Like, for example, and before you think, oh my goodness, he's putting his foot in it, I have permission. It's not Facebook official, but we have some very exciting news. 
about Jack and Zoe. Jack and Zoe are expecting the little pitter patter of feet. <laughs> Yoo hoo! There's Jack. <laughs> <laughs> now Zoe's, Zoe's often wired at the moment, so just please, when you see her, present the same level of excitement, okay? <laughs> but we have congratulations, Jack. That is so that is so cool. Such good news. So if you've been around and you've seen Zoe be quite uh, not quite herself over the last few months, then you understand why. Um, but you know, that's not Facebook official. It, you know, like it's it's just it's just good news. And here we are with these shepherds. And these shepherds have a moment like that, where, where they are presented with something that is, is epic, that is big news, and the rest of the world doesn't know about it yet. You know, and so what we want to do this morning is just kind of, how do they react to this news, you know? Uh, and I want, to, I want to read to you soon from in Luke 2, where we, where we see the shepherds, where they come into the story. But kind of before we even get there, you know, it's good for us to just stop and ask the question, well, who the hang are these shepherds in the first place? You know, why was it that these shepherds were so special that God chose to reveal in one of the most spectacular ways that we see in all of Scripture this incredible news, you know? So shepherds, all right, shepherds, a little bit of conjecture about it. Uh, some people are in the, in the thinking that they might have been a, a special group of shepherds, that were involved in preparing things for temple activity, sacrificial offerings, and so forth. Um, they were involved in, in that sort of uh, piece of it. But the more general understanding of who these shepherds were, the more commonly thought, um, you know, scholarly thought about this group of shepherds is just that they were regular old shepherds. <laughs> They'd happened to be close by to Bethlehem because of the time of year that it was uh, and where they needed to graze their sheep, and that's why they were there. And that, you know, and, and shepherds, they didn't have a good rap. <laughs> Shepherd, shepherds were like the outsiders. Shepherds were, they were looked down on. They were, um, like, like, they didn't even have a good reputation in, term of, in terms of their honesty, apparently. So they, would, they, would, they became known for being dishonest of, as they moved around countryside and so forth, of taking a bit more than they should have. They, they worked in the dirt and the filth that are associated with farm life. They were, they, they, their work meant that they couldn't participate in, in much temple activity. They weren't the special ones, you know? They were the outsiders. They were the, the non-religious. They were, the, they, they, were, they were just kind of a bit, hmm, shepherds. <laughs> And so here is this moment where God reveals something to just this, hmm, shepherds. And perhaps that's part of the point. Hey, you know, that this Christmas story that we, that we celebrate, that we talk about, you know, it's not, it's not about the special, it's not about the anointed, it's not about the, uh, you know, the, the, those that fit the mold, it's for, it's for those outside of that. It's for those who don't regard themselves as holy enough, who, who don't see that they've, they're squeaky clean and that they've got it all together, who aren't spectacular, who aren't special in the society around them sort of way of thinking. People like you and me. And of course, the other thing uh, about the shepherds is that, you know, within the Old Testament, so the, within Scripture, the, uh, before Christ is born, the writings around that, uh, we have this theme of shepherding begin to, to come out, Leah, pretty clearly, where, where God refers to himself as being the good shepherd. Uh, you know, you've got famous Psalm, Psalm, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing, he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters, he refreshes my soul, the good shepherd, the, the shepherd, the one who wants to look after his flock, who wants to see his flock flourish. Even Jesus himself later on in his life, would go on to say in John 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd. 
the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So perhaps there's something in this shepherd thing. All right, Luke 2. Let's have a look at the story uh, of what takes place with this cool group of shepherds. <laughs> in verse 8. You with me so far? Making sense? All right. You're not, too th- you're not thinking about like what you need to buy for you on your Christmas list or you're here, you're present. Do you need to nudge the person next to you at all? All right. Luke 2, verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Right, so we're in the night shift, okay? Verse 9. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, thank you, good piece of information. I bring you good news that will cause joy, uh, great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. You know, so here's this, this full-on moment for these shepherds, all right? Minding their own business, looking after their sheep, And then, you know, bam, here comes this angel appearing to them, announcing the Messiah, the Lord, the King has been born. Now, even though they would have been outside of a a lot of activity within within culture, they still would be uh, aware enough of the stories that are being told about this King that is to come one day. You know, they're still going to be aware of this promised King. And this angel comes to bring them this great news uh, that is of great joy. And I'm not sure if the, if the shepherds necessarily click to it straight away or what. But, the, but Luke, you know, writing this gospel, he's trying to make it clear to us, the reader, that this is, in fact, the Christ. This, 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 is, this is a big deal the one that had been anticipated that would come, Uh, the one that was going to bring peace like never before, the one to make a way of true relationship, true engagement, true true encounter that we can have with God. Angel carries on, verse 12. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So in talking to the shepherds, the angel is trying to give them specific enough information that they actually know that they've found what they've meant to have been out to find. So we, you know, we often look at the kind of the messiness of the manger scene, the you know, the animals that are around and so forth. That's all fine. But the the reason why the angel is telling the shepherds this is, you know, Bethlehem is a, is a hubbub of activity. They're, they're in the middle of the census. As we've heard over the last couple of weeks, Mary and Joseph, you know, have been pulled into, into Bethlehem. Uh, and so there's a bunch of people who are coming. It's very possible that we, there were multiple babies that had been born in the last little while, you know. So these shepherds, if they were to have found what they were meant to have found, they need to know that they've found it. And so that's why they're saying you will find a baby lying in a manger. All right, verse 13. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. I wonder if it's kind of like the first flash mob. You know, you've got the angel there, and then poof, hallelujah chorus, you know. (laughs) Anyway. And it's interesting that, like, you know, this is where the fireworks happen. You know, just before the, where we started in verse 8, there's a couple of, like, a couple of sentences that talk about the baby Jesus being born. Sorry, mums, I know that there's more to it than that, but, like, And this wasn't just any baby, you know, this is is Jesus. But within Scripture, within the way, the telling of the story from Luke is just, you know, Mary gave birth to the baby Jesus, you know. But the shepherds, you know, wow, angels, hallelujah chorus, you know, like, 
This is where the fireworks is. This is where the big deal is. Upon this motley crew of regular old shepherds. Verse 15. When the angels had left them uh, and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. There is this sense of, of urgency in the way that they respond to what they've just heard. Uh, verse 16, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. They returned back to the fields, telling everybody about what they'd just seen and heard. And uh, we don't actually hear too much more uh, about these shepherds. Probably they go back to um, looking after their sheep. I don't know. But there is this radical moment. Now, I've... Uh, not that I'm aware of anyway. I don't think I've ever had an angelic visitation, uh, let alone uh, a whole host of angels. But yet I think that there is still um, there's great benefit in looking at just the, sh- the shepherd's reaction to what has, uh, what has taken place. And, and kind of as I reflect upon you know, just this little story involving the shepherds, there's kind of three sort of words or, or themes that, uh, that really kind of stand out to me, you know? And I, I, think that they're, uh, I think that they're important and good for us to note within Scripture, but I, I think that more importantly, they're good for us to note in terms of the Christmas story. And the first of those sort of words is the word movement. Movement. You know, for these shepherds. In verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. As we take a, uh, a fresh look at Christmas, as we come around the story again, I want to encourage you towards movement. These shepherds, when they hear this news, their reaction, well, if what you're saying is true, let's go. Let's go and find this baby that you're talking about. Let's go and find the Christ, the Messiah. Are you saying that the Messiah has been born? Let's go. As we stop and reflect and, and look at the story as we approach this season, would we move? Would we move towards the Christ? You know, with, within lots of different contexts, you know, we've just uh, got this love candle. You know, within love, uh, like Jacinda was saying, a verb, doing, doing work. I got that right there. Um, it's a, it involves movement, often involves movement. It's sometimes physically, yes, but movement in our hearts, movement in our attitudes, movement in our perspectives, movements to forgive. Like we were talking about, movement to, to see something from somebody else's perspective. What will our response be over this Christmas time? Do we just kind of leave it off in the distance as a nice story to talk about or to tell? Or do we in our own, our own ways, you know, you know what this will look like for you. 
or we make a decision to move towards the Christ. Movement. For some of us, we're here and we're Christians. We're we're Christ followers. And it involves like a, maybe a, a deepening of looking into Scripture or maybe using this holiday season to dig into different ways of engaging with God, of, of praying, of connecting, of interacting. Maybe it just involves some, uh, some specific decisions within your life, deliberate decisions to move towards the Christ. But there may well be others here who, you know, you're a, you're a bit more in that, in that zone of the shepherds. You might have heard people talking, uh, you know, about Jesus. You might have heard the story, but you've, you've never actually encountered, you never met Christ for yourself. You know, maybe for you this Christmas time, that's, that's your movement to begin to explore what it would mean in very real terms to do life with Jesus, to invite him into your world, to ask him to come and to be an active part of your life. Um, you know, as Coast Vineyard, that would be our greatest privilege to be able to help walk that journey with you if that's, if that's the space that you're in. And I, a little bit later on, I, I'd, I'd like to just give a little opportunity for, for you, if you are in that space, just to, to start the ball rolling, so to speak. But movement, movement, and it's interesting, even within the Christmas story, there's, there's, movement has this real theme, eh? Uh, like, either it's forced or it's chosen. You know, Mary and Joseph, they had movement, but it was forced. <laughs> but yet, that inconvenience led on to fulfilling prophecy. You know, that God still used that forced movement to be able to tell a story. And of course, with the shepherds, it's more chosen. And I think that's actually a good little bit of reflection over the year that we've had, right? <laughs> you know, that some of the movement that we've had, or restricted movement <laughs> that we've had, has been forced. But yet God can still work and still move within that. And then there's the choice. Movement. All right, next word. It's the theme of recognition. Recognition. When, when these shepherds came across the baby wrapped in a manger, they clearly recognized that this was, in fact, the Christ. They recognized who he was. Um, N.T. Wright says this when talking about it. When you see the manger on a card or in a church, don't stop at the crib. See what it's pointing to. It is pointing to the explosive truth that the baby lying in uh, there is already being spoken of as the true king of the world. <laughs> they recognized who this baby was into the messiness and what looks like weakness and insignificance and vulnerability. There is this recognition of a world-changing, kingdom-bringing, freedom-offering Messiah that's lying within this manger. He's going to turn the world upside down, not in the way that they perhaps expected it, but in a far better, far deeper, far more meaningful uh, sort of way. Like the angels are saying in verse 14, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace, this idea of, of blessing that Christ would bring to the earth, salvation in all of its fullness. Uh, and I guess sort of to me, worship, um, recognition just speaks of worship, you know, of, of orientating our hearts towards, uh, to wo- towards who Jesus really is, to worship him above the, the noise and the chaos that is the Christmas season, to stop, move towards the Christ, and worship. Would you worship? I know that you do. I know that's why you're here. <laughs> you could be doing a million other things. 
but you're here because you want to just create space and time in your life to be able to worship God. By turning our hearts and our attention towards Christ, worship by not choosing to kind of buy into the consumeristic sort of rubbish that goes on around Christmas, but instead to worship the King. You know, like we're just we're just singing a moment ago. Wasn't that beautiful? Just you are way maker, America. Anyway. They moved, they recognized, they worshipped. And then and then there was uh, an expression. You know, just they wanted to tell others. Their natural response to being presented with this news was that they wanted to tell others. Verse 17, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. There's a message at Christmas time that's worth telling others about. <laughs> that it's great good news. I, um, uh, I was... Uh, I saw Facebook yesterday and I saw uh, Jason uh, uh, just recount an encounter that he'd had with someone just locally yesterday, I think, and um, just the story of telling them about this Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas time. Uh, If you don't, I don't know, I can't tell you all the details. Sorry, I shouldn't have started the story. It was a really good story. (laughs) Sorry, man. Just, uh, wave your head. So um, go and ask him afterwards, all right? That gets me out of it, you see. No, it's just a beautiful story of there's someone who is in need of something more than what they had in life. And Jason was just happy to tell them about Jesus. We've got a story to tell. I know, I know, I know that, that we... Um, we kind of get the sense of holding back, being politically correct, of, you know, just, just careful. But you know what? It's really good news. The Savior that's being born. We have an opportunity around Christmas time where so much of the world actually, just, just for a glimpse, they stop and reflect around this story. There's an opportunity that's here. And this is what the, the shepherds do. They hear the news and their immediate response to go to tell others. Intertwined in this this mess of what we see within the manger scene is just this beautiful, amazing story of love and of inclusion where God reaches down into our messy lives and offers us a new start. a new thing to be able to step into. And just as we sort of begin to uh, wrap up and close this morning, in fact, if I could ask the band to come and uh, join me, I reckon we should do some of that worshipping thing. Again, yeah. Um, you know, I just, I just, just, as we've just tried to stop and take this fresh look at Christmas as we spend time and enter into the season with family and friends and I know some of you will still be working through, but hopefully at some point within the, you know, the next little while you've got a chance to stop. As we consider the shepherds, let's be a people who would move, who would recognize and would express. Move towards Christ, recognize him as our Savior and express the good news that it is to other 